So here we have the two big neo-impressionist painters, Signac, and there's not a lot from Sora. Unfortunately, Sora died uh, pretty prematurely. <clears throat> But Sora and Signac, so Sora is the one that kind of invents this technique. He will, these two will, will be influenced by the Impressionists, right? They will, they will know Pizarro and, and Sicily. They will probably paint with some of them. <clears throat> and they will read some of the same texts that are theorizing about how light works, how color works. But they will, more so than the Impressionists, they will, they will endeavor, especially Sora will endeavor to work in a very, in a kind of scientific way. And so the theory that already the Impressionists had begun to think of, I didn't say this to you before, but Manet was still using black in his paintings, right? So I told you about how he add black to make his you know, colors look like shadows. The Impressionists are going to say, we're going to ban, we're not going to use black in our paintings anymore. We're just going to use pure color. And they tried to limit white as well. Right? They tried to use you know, just different colors, reds, blues, and all that. And so what they would do even Delacroix was already starting to do this, that he was sometimes putting little, little strokes of paint side by side. And the theory that starts to develop is that when you see a yellow dot next to a red dot, the human eye sort of blends it and makes it into orange. Right? It might be debatable whether that's actually going to happen or not. But if you look, for example, at this Signac painting here, you notice, if you go up close to it, you'll, you'll see that that many of the, the brush strokes are actually <clears throat> more pure colors, right? We, from a distance, we see, for example, the umbrella. There are ways where it goes kind of reddish into purple, and then others where it comes more to orange and then into yellow. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that right around this time, and I haven't been able to confirm whether uh, Soha was aware of this, but there's a development of something we call a halftone screen for printing, for lithographic printing. So a halftone screen, I may have mentioned this. Lithography has these, it started out working on these big litho stones that are made of sandstone, big thick things that weigh 10, 15, 20 kilo. And you drew on them. <clears throat> and you had to treat the drawing, right, which was made with a greasy pencil, with nitric acid. And that sort of anchored that greasy pencil into the stone. And then as long as you kept the rest of the plate wet, when you rolled over with greasy ink, the greasy ink jumped onto the greasy stone where you made the greasy drawing, and those areas that weren't drawn upon but were treated with uh, nitric acid reject the ink. And so you can make a, an almost perfect reproduction of your drawing in this way, and as many as you wanted. And so <clears throat> lithography is, is kind of a, an on-off system, just like computers in a way, right? Zeros and one. You made that drawing in that area, it will attract ink. You didn't it will reject ink, right? So either it prints that color or it doesn't print that color. So we'll see when we come back, we'll see some, uh, some more Toulouse-Lautrec images from the end of the 19th century. He did lots and lots of work in lithography. <clears throat> and he did color work, but keep it simple. We'll just deal with black and white. So basically, either you, you make a drawing and you get the full strength of black. You don't get grays. You get either all black or nothing at all. <clears throat> and so what happens here with a halftone screen they find a way to, to break up <clears throat> that notion of on and off into little dots. And the dots, I'm sure you've seen this. If you look at black and white newspapers of photographs, photograph re reproduction, if you look at it with a little magnifying glass, you'll see that there's only one color. In a black and white newspaper, there's only one color of ink, and it's all the same color. It's just that when you look at a photograph, the dot sizes change. For an area that looks like it's black, the dot sizes are really big, and there's very little white paper that shows. When it's a mid-tone, it's about half and half. And when it's a highlight area, there are little tiny black dots and mostly just paper. Right? And so <clears throat> he's not quite doing the different size dot here, but there's a way in which he's saying, all right, I'm just going to add more of this color to push it more towards, there's, there's like yellow as an underpainting, and then he adds more and more of red to push it progressively up the scale towards a more red, either first orange and then more red. Right? It's just a way of, of mixing that up. So one of the things that's striking about both of these painters, and I think you can see it, these three paintings show it quite well, and that one also will show it better when we get closer, is that unlike the Impressionists, right? The Impressionists are not working like Delacroix, right? They're not making these big, long strokes, right? There's a shoulder, boom. I just dropped that shoulder like that. You know, there's the side of the head. There's not that. <clears throat> there's, you know, this kind of stuff, right? It's kind of dot, dot, dot. 
you know, and they're like, oh, change the color for here, but, you know, they're just kind of doing this sort of thing. Here, it's da, 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 da. It starts to become more of a mechanical mark. It's not at all mechanical, but the marks resemble each other more than the impressionist remark, marks do. And for me, <clears throat> there's a kind of stiffness and a kind of control of these paintings that's quite different from a very organic feeling of the Impressionist paintings, right? Here, it, it feels, it does feel mechanical. It feels machine-like, right? It just feels like it's the same thing. And so there's, there's a kind of, maybe a loss. I mean, if you look at this, this painting here, right? This, the figures are often quite stiff, right? They don't look like a real, this is not fluid at all. And if you look at that, we'll get closer to the one at the end here. This is the last painting that Seurat did before he died. Le Cirque, the circus. This came apparently from, he saw a poster advertising a circus. Oh, that's cool. Let me use that as a reference point for making the painting. And so it's an unfinished painting, but uh, so probably it would have been fuller in color than it is. Uh, but even though, you've, I mean, there's a certain amount of movement, the dancer that's on the back of the horse and so on, but there's a way in which it feels quite stiff. And I think part of that is the fact that it's this little dot, dot, dot style. Let's just go and take a quick look at that, and then maybe we'll finish with this. All right, so if you get up really close to this one, it's, it's really good to see what we have here, right? So you see in this area, for example, that you've got this, it looks like it's sort of pinkish red in the background there. And then on top of it, you've got blue dots and yellow dots, right? And so it, it sort of creates this, this evolution from something that's, maybe a little more orangey here and more purplish there, right? Just according to how those, you know, whether there's more of this color or not. And then here you've got, you know, well, there are a few different colors, but it's, in majority, it's yellow, and there's a little bit of pink that comes out, and then we get into blues, right? And so it's just the way, the percentage of, of the different strokes that push it from one color to another. And again, you know, this, I mean, if you look at the way the figures, the faces, right, there's not, there's not a, a lot of sense of volume to how these people are represented. And there's not really a lot of distinctiveness. They all look kind of like, I don't know, like dolls or something. They don't look very, very different one from another, right? They're, they're very s similar style. And there's kind of a, I don't know, to me there's always a, a strange lack of, of energy in the paintings, right? Even though, even with a subject like this, with, you know, people that are jumping around, there's this kind of weird, especially the people in the background, they don't look like they're having much fun, do they? Like, uh, <laughs> what's going on here? So it's interesting to, there's a painting that uh, we won't be able to see in person, but there's one that we'll look at, I think, in class of his that's, that's quite beautiful, that's done in Paris. Uh, the, that's a, the, some of you may know this, the Grand Jatt this little island in the middle of the Seine River that's over west of Paris. You get a chance to go there, it's a, especially on a sunny, sunny day, it's really beautiful. And so you've got this people out in the park on a sunny day next to the Seine River. And so everything says, oh, this must be, you know, happy weekend, all the family. But when you actually look at the people, it's not that they look depressed, but they look flat. They look like no one has any emotion at all. It's, it's really kind of surprising. And so one of the questions that and I don't have the answer to this. The question is whether Seurat is actually making a criticism of the people, right? that these, you know, kind of the bourgeois that are out in the park, and, and you know, that it's like they should be having fun, but they're like, oh, you know, must follow the rules, must do things that are becoming to a person of my class, kind of thing. So. <laughs>